get into it. Awesome. Thank you so much. All righty. So where we're picking up uh, this week is Bill's story. And what I love about Bill's story is, is it's so much like so much of my experience in this book. I came to this story with a lot of old ideas, a lot of preconceived notions. I did a quick read through and I'm like, I know. I know. I know this Bill guy. I know his story and I don't like him. I'm judging him. He's this old guy. He's a stockbroker. He's not even a stockbroker. He's a stock speculator. Um, but I don't like him. I The only thing I gathered, I'm like, you probably cheated on your wife. But the more times that I spent in this book and in Bill's story, especially with alcoholics, who were armed with the facts about themselves and it were able to, to show me their experience in Bill's story, the more that I was able to see myself in Bill's story. And, and kind of my hope today is that we can all kind of see and relate and experience Bill's story in hopefully a new way. Even, even if we've been in Bill's story a lot, you're like, I know, Hampshire Grenadier. Yeah, yeah, I know the gold, the Goldfoot Dairy Farm in Scotia, New York. Like, I, I know all that. I know all that, right? Hopefully we can have just a new experience. And one of the things as we go through Bill's story, what Bill is trying to do is he is trying to qualify himself to us. So he's trying to, in his own words, in his own experience, explain what alcoholism is. And so last week we went through the doctor's opinion and we were given a lot of the diagnostic criteria of alcoholism. Right, the physical allergy, the mental obsession. We spoke about the cycle, that swearing off, I'm never going to drink again. And we're going to look as we go through Bill's story and see his examples of his cycle. We're going to see and look for his alcoholism and just see where we can relate. So chapter one, Bill's story, if you're following along in your book, well, I hope you are, uh, we're going to start on page one. So page one, Bill's story. And so it says, war fever ran high. I know I'm like two words in and I'm already explaining after I did a whole lot of explaining. Uh, but the war that we're talking about is World War I. So war fever ran high. World War I is what it's talking about. And one of the things I have always found helpful was to kind of have a timeline of when did these things happen? And so World War I happened between 1914 and 1918. And a lot of Bill's, Bill Wilson's experience, we're going to be talking late 1918. I know you're like, whoa, I can't, can't wait for the historical timeline for the years, the anthology. Uh, I'm here for that. So war fever ran high in the New England towns to which we knew young officers from Plattsburgh were assigned. And we were flattered when the first citizens took us to their homes, making us feel heroic. So this First World War, um, just kind of the, the like atmosphere around it for a lot of the young soldiers, was it was that first sort of like, uh, almost, how would I describe it, a bit of a gap year where you go backpacking in Europe. I mean, they would come to find the horrors of war, but there was that first little bit of excitement and, oh, what's going to happen? Right now, he's in the United States. He's from Plattsburgh. That's just a town in New York. And he's training and he's training to be an officer in the military. And it's fun and it's, it's exciting. And he says here with love, applause, war, moments sublime with intervals hilarious. I was part of life at last. And that line speaks to me of the spiritual malady. Because I know what it's like to feel apart from life, to feel separate from, to feel not, not a part of, to feel not included. And Bill Wilson is, he's saying, this is it. I feel for the first time a part of, like I belong. And in the midst of the excitement, I discovered liquor. Uh-oh. <laughs> Let's see what happens. I forgot the strong warnings and the prejudices of my people concerning drink. And what that likely means is growing up and, and in his family, Bill got a lot of warnings from his family saying, Bill, you come from a long line of alcoholics. It's probably not a good idea for you to drink. There's a lot of alcoholic apples in our family tree. You should probably stay away from drinking. Now, that wasn't my experience. I didn't happen to have a lot of alcoholics in my family. I didn't realize there was alcoholism in, in my family until after I'd gotten sober. 
But I know a lot of people have that experience of, yeah, there was clear alcoholism in my family. And that warning might be something that helps us relate to Bill. So it says, in time, we sailed for over there. Over there was the saying that the American soldiers had for, for Europe and specifically England. And he says, I was very lonely and again turned to alcohol. And for me, that is a very, very important line. See, for me, that is the first time we just got through the very first paragraph, but that is the first time we are seeing Bill Wilson actively use alcohol to treat the spiritual malady, to treat the spiritual sickness. And maybe you're like, hey, well, I don't know, he's in Europe, he's feeling a little lonely. Um, I'll just let you know what my experience is, and, and maybe it's yours. So for me, loneliness has become a synonym for the spiritual malady, because I don't know about you, but for me, I know what it is like to feel absolutely lonely in a stadium full of people, maybe at a hockey game, Maybe maybe the Leafs were beating the Panthers. Yeah. Uh, I'm just teasing. Um, but I know what it's like to feel alone in a stadium, alone in a room full of people, alone in a room full of people who suffer from alcoholism. I know what it's like to feel alone in a relationship. And again, I don't know about you, but I, but for me, I know what it is like to feel absolutely alone in the middle of an act of intimacy. And so for me, that loneliness speaks far more of that sense of separateness from God. And I'm kind of leaning into some of our later uh, promises and some of the later stuff that we have in this book. But in, in step five, we have promises all over. And I love finding them and prayers all over. And I love pointing them out. But in the step five promises, it talks about how we can be alone at perfect peace and ease. We feel the nearness of our creator. So for me, that loneliness really is that hallmark of spiritual sickness. And by sickness, I just mean spiritual pain, that sense of disconnect from God. And the coolest thing is when we get into this, uh, I'm saying the step 12 promises, there's more than one set of them. There's so many promises in, in working with others. But it talks about how we, how we watch loneliness vanish. So we get to experience that freedom from loneliness. And, and more than that, we get to help others experience that freedom from loneliness. Man, that is powerful. And that is quite a tangent for the first paragraph, but I didn't know it was happening. Like it was a semi-planned tangent. I knew we were going there and I brought us back. All right. So Bill Wilson is using alcohol to relieve that loneliness. We landed in England and I visited Winchester Cathedral. So um, I want to point out that uh, Bill Wilson, he, he ends up in um, England in August of 1918. The World War I ended November of 1918, November 11th, Armistice Day. So that's when World War I formally stopped. And, and so Bill Wilson, he actually didn't see any frontline combat. Um, he didn't see any of the horrors of war, but he would have known and did know that that was, that was a reality. And so he's visiting Winchester Cathedral and um, what I might do is I'll, I'll just share this picture. If you've never seen um, Winchester Cathedral, uh, on the inside especially, like with those ceilings, um, it's very ornate, it's very intricate. Um, and it's this, it's this beautiful uh, church. And, and it's, a, it's a sightseeing, a touristy thing. Like who wouldn't go see Winchester Cathedral? So he's visiting it. And in this uh, next line, it says, much move. And in that, um, we don't really say what happened, right? We don't really explain um, what's, what's going on or what happened. He just says much moved. And um, when you read some of the other literature in Bill's story, um, we hear uh, what happened to him and what happened for him in, in that cathedral. And what happened to Bill Wilson was he was sitting in that cathedral and, and he was essentially reflecting on, man, all these young men are going and they're dying and, and he was just reflecting on life and the meaning of life and what is the purpose of all of this and in that moment he felt the nearness of God. In that moment, sitting in that cathedral, he felt, felt the nearness of his creator. And he had a spiritual, just a spiritual awakening, like no big, um, but he just had this moment of the presence 
of God. And I bring that up because in Bill's story, he's going to reference this moment like two or three other times. This was a profound effect that it had on Bill. But we're going to see it wasn't enough to keep him sober, right? He had to follow it up with action, which he didn't know to have. He didn't know. He, at this point, he has no idea he, you know, is an alcoholic and is, is going to have alcoholism. But he has that connectedness with God in that moment. And, and just as it comes, it goes quickly. In, um, in reading about it, it was something like his friends were like, hey, Bill, off to war, we. They probably didn't go we because they're, you know, soldiers and men trying to be all tough. I say we because I'm a child. Uh, we. Uh, but uh, they were like off to war. And his, he, his attention, as soon as his attention goes, that sense of God leaves as well. And so he says, much moved, I wandered outside. He goes to say, my attention was caught by a dog roll on an old tombstone. And I kind of like to make the joke, like a dog roll, if you don't know, that's, um, that's an inscription or like a, a writing or an epitaph on the tombstone. And it's just like he had this profound moment of God in this beautiful church that like people would travel all over the world to go see. And he does the very happy-go-lucky alcoholic thing, which is wander the graveyard, just hanging out in the graveyard. Everything's great, having a great time. And he sees this tombstone. And on it, it says, here lies a Hampshire grenadier. So it says, here lies a young man from a place in England called Hampshire. And a grenadier was just somebody who um, very literally threw grenades. So it was essentially um, somebody that was in the artillery unit. And how Bill Wilson is reading the tombstone. What the information that Bill Wilson is getting from this tombstone, when it says, who caught his death drinking cold small beer, is here is a young soldier who died of alcoholism. And Bill Wilson happened to be in the artillery unit which not a perfect parallel to, to a grenadier, but very similar sort of in uh, the modality of, of war, at least from my understanding. So here's a young soldier just like me, who is in a unit just like me, who died of alcoholism. And on the tombstone, it says, a good soldier is ne'er forgot, whether he dieth by musket or by pot. And so what it's saying is we don't forget a good soldier, whether he dies on the battlefield and in, in, in heroism or he dies by pot. Now, pot was a unit of alcohol, so it, it didn't mean the green stuff, um, but it was a unit of alcohol. And uh, the, the gentleman who is on the tombstone, his name is Thomas, T-H-O-M-A-S, Fetcher, T H E T. C-H-E-R. He, he died in 1764 and he died at the age of 26, Thomas Fetcher. And it's one of those things, man, of all, and it wasn't too, the, the tombstone isn't too far out into the cemetery. It's not like, you know, too far away from the church, but of all, and it's a pretty big tombstone. It would probably be for most people, maybe about shoulder high or armpit high. It's a big tombstone. But I always reflect, it's like, why of all, why of all the tombstones, why would that one stick out? Why would that one um, really like stand out for him? And if you were here the last few weeks, you might remember a name that's very similar to Thomas Thatcher, and it is the name Ebby Thatcher, T-A-C-H-E-R, a childhood friend of Bill's. And is it perhaps that that is why that of all the tombstones stood out? And it's that cool moment of, man, if, I'm, if I ever struggled to believe in a power greater than myself, that's part of why I absolutely love the history. Because for me, I can see God all the way through it. And um, he says, ominous warning, which I failed to heed. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I had some ominous warnings in my life. It wasn't a tombstone, but, uh, and I kind of share this story um, Growing up at the age I did in the country that I did, or at least the province that I did in health class, they made us watch this documentary again and again and again. Also the movie Rudy, and I don't, that has nothing to do with alcoholism. I just had to watch it a lot. But the documentary was about um, heroin addicts on the downtown east side of Vancouver, 
which is, you know, one of the highest rates of, of drug use and HIV infections and, and like the horrors of, of addiction. And I would sit there in the seventh grade, no, no drug history, no drinking, nothing like that. And I would see these people who had absolutely like ruined their life and they were dying of this disease. And I'd think, I get it. I get it. Now, it was also, that would absolutely never be me. I was never going to do that. I absolutely would never go down that path. But there was this gift of identification where I was like, oh, I kind of get why you can't stop. And I don't know why I had that moment. And I don't, but that was that ominous warning for me. And for some people, it's seeing parents or loved ones drink and, and that like, hey, we've, we've got a lot of alcoholics in, in our lives. It's probably not a good idea to drink. There's a number of ways, but that was just that was just my gift of or just my ominous warning, which I'll tell you was welcome. It was pretty loud. <laughs> All right. And so 22 and a veteran of foreign wars, I went home at last. I fancied myself a leader, for had not the men of my battery given me a special token of appreciation. Now Again, I don't know about you guys, but when I showed up to, to Bill's story, I'm like, this dude's full of ego. And I'd be, look at that. This guy, Bill, oh, his ego. Oh, I fancied myself a leader. Um, I will say in this moment, that sounds like a fair assessment. Because in this moment, the men of his, his battery, like the men that he was leading as an officer in the war, had given him a commendation. He had received actually a pocket watch saying, you are a good leader. So in that moment, I would say probably an accurate assessment of his skills and abilities. My talent for leadership, I imagined, would place me at the head of vast enterprises, which I would manage with the utmost assurance. That might be more the ego. <laughs> that, that might be it. But I will also say, I mean, he did co-found a worldwide movement Alcoholics Anonymous, which from that sprang off other fellowships. So, I mean, again, perhaps Amigo, but also maybe not wrong, you know, maybe. Um, so going over to page two. I know we're going to go this one slowly, you guys. We're going to deep dive, have some fun, learn all about Bill. And, and hopefully Bill will also become your homie, Bill, like he's become my homie. <laughs> all right. I took a night law course. And what basically he went to Brooklyn Law School. And so he's studying to be a lawyer at night. And, and the reason I point this out is because much of the big book, especially Bill's story, was written by Bill. And if you're like me, a lot of the language was a little inaccessible. A lot of the, the language used made me bristle with antagonism. <laughs> like it's this old language. I don't know what it means. What are you talking about? So it's helpful for me to remember that he was educated as a lawyer in the 1920s. And we know lawyers are paid for the big fancy words. So he's got this big fancy word vocabulary. But also, and it was a sponsee who pointed this out to me, lawyers are not just paid to use the big fancy word. Lawyers are paid to be very precise with their word. Because when they're doing contracts and that sort of thing, they need to make sure there's no loopholes which is another reason why I feel so strongly about going line by line, even if it takes us a little while in the study, um, because I really want to understand. And so that is it possible that when Bill wrote this, he was using that precision so that we could all glean a deeper understanding. So he takes a night law course and obtained employment as an investigator for a surety company. The surety company was US Fidelity and Guarantee Co. And that doesn't really matter. That's just a fun fact that if you're if you're doing like AA or CA or 12 step trivia, maybe around Halloween, um, you, you can win. You're like, oh, I'm going to I'm going to crush that 12 step trivia. But what is important about that is what the heck is a surety company? Because I don't again, I don't know. I, my first reading of this book, I've already zoned out. I don't care. You know what I mean? Brooklyn lawyer, whatever, ego, blah, blah. I, I don't relate. I don't understand what's going on. So a surety company was a company uh, that would basically give loans to other companies and small businesses. That is what they would do. And an investigator would basically go investigate 
the companies that were to receive the loans to see if it was a good investment to see if they would pay the loan back to see if it was like if, if it was safe to do so and so that is bill wilson's um sort of employment history and as we go through this page we're going to see why i pointed that out um but that's sort of that's that's where he's coming from the drive for success was on i'd prove to the world i was important and to me that line speaks so clearly again about that spiritual malady and speaks to me far more about a less than ego a feeling of not being enough than it does alcoholic grandiosity because for me i don't need to prove that which i know that i am see if i came to to do this big book study tonight and i was like hey guys i'm sober and you'd be like yes Paige." we assumed we were kind of hoping and i was like no 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 i'm sober listen my sobriety date november 17th 2009 i'm sober I am sober, I'm clean and sober. I am free from all mood of mind. The more I insist, the more you're like, girl, she's been drinking, right? I don't have to prove that which I know that I am. And I, and I don't know what it's like to try to prove that I am some sort of success in big business. I don't, but I know what it's like to try to look for things outside of me to prove that I have value and worth and just maybe I might be important. And I know what that's like. I know what that's like. So my work took me about Wall Street and little by little, I became interested in the markets. Many people lost money, ominous warning, but some became very rich. That sort of alcoholic enthusiasm, Wee! Um, Why not I? I studied economics and business as well as law. Potential alcoholic that I was, I nearly failed my law course. At one of the finals, I was too drunk to think or write. And if you're writing in your book, you can make a little note that that is a sign that Bill Wilson has the physical allergy. This is not a teenager, like drinking at a house party on a weekend and finding their limit. This is a man in law school who is so drunk at his final exam in law school that he cannot think or write. Have I ever done something similar? We can ask ourselves, yes. Yes, I have, I have. It was only a midterm, which I used to justify and rationalize. I don't have a problem. It was only a midterm. Um, but I don't like for those things, have I, that's a sign that he was not able to control the amount that he took. Because somebody who has the ability to control, somebody who does not have the physical allergy is gonna have a drink or two maybe the night before to unwind and then show up to the exam sober, not so blackout drunk, one can barely think or write. Though my drinking was not yet continuous, so he is at no point at, at this, on page two, he is not a daily drinker. It disturbed my wife. Here's my experience, my drinking, my, and because I have to also have a drug history, my drinking, my drug use, uh, it really concerned people around me far far sooner than I ever thought it was a problem. Did I have people coming up and say, hey Paige, I don't, I'm concerned about your drinking or Paige, I'm concerned about some of the decisions you're making. Is that my experience that people were worried about it far before, far sooner than I was. And then what do I usually do with those people? Okay, bye, get out of my life, you know? Um, so it disturbed his life. We had long talks when I would steal her forebodings by telling her that men of genius conceive their best projects when drunk, that the most majestic constructions of philosophic thought were so derived. So I didn't have that hubris. Um, my, I did not have unmitigated gall. I had mitigated gall. I had some gall. So what he's saying is like, Lois, I need to drink. Men of genius and probably financial leaders of genius, I know nothing about. Uh, but let's say Socrates, Plato, the, the you know, foundations of democracy and capitalism and blah, 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 came from men who, who drank and that gave them their best ideas. I, again, not me. I did not. But did I defend it? Did I defend my drinking with everything that I had? Did I always have a, you don't understand, you don't know, I, I need, I need to drink. And that was my experience. Um, so by the time I completed the course, I knew the law was not for me. 
the inviting maelstrom of Wall Street had me in its grip, and a maelstrom is like that whirling dervish, that tornado. And if you've ever seen any movie about Wall Street at any time in history, it's always that chaos. You know, papers are flying, and men in suits are like, buy, buy, sell, sell it, pandemonium. And again, this does not qualify us for alcoholism, but do a lot of us not have a bit of a penchant for chaos? And when I'm working with sponsees and, and that thing where it's like, man, it's, it's a little calm. I'm always like, don't worry if you're bothered and missing the chaos of your active addiction or your active alcoholism. Don't you worry. Get involved in service. That itch will be scratched. <laughs> um, yeah. And if you haven't gotten involved in service, do, do. It's a wonderful experience. All right. <laughs> so business and financial leaders were my heroes out of this alloy of drink and speculation and an alloy what that is is a mixture of two metals so he's combining his drinking with his work on wall street his guessing on on which companies are going to be successful he's combining those two and he says i commenced to forge the weapon that's very telling see he, he's not uh forging like a vehicle that will take him to success He's not forging a pathway. No, he's forg forging a weapon. Imagine like a sword. That, and that tells me, at least for me, that the how he sees the world is not a safe place. That he has, needs a weapon to use to hack, to cut, to slash his way to prove that he has value and worth. To prove that he's important. It's a weapon. And again, that tells me about what's kind of going on on the inside. And that would one day turn in its flight like a boomerang and all but cut me to ribbon. So the weapon that he's going to use, I don't know about this. This is real niche. Like you kind of have to have grown up and been a certain age at the in the 90s, maybe. But if anyone ever here has seen Xena, the warrior princess, there's some nods and some blank stares. Um, she has a circular, I think it's called a chakram or something, I don't know, but this circular throwing weapon. And so she would throw it. And then of course, cause it's the nineties, they would have those like cuts where it's like cutting off like trees and walls and go, ching, 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 ching. you know, I'd like, ching. you know, it would do that, right? And so it was doing that and uh, it's proven to the world he's important. It's working for him, but then it comes back around. Now, Bill Wilson is not Xena the warrior princess because Xena the warrior princess catches it and she catches it and she's like woo this really cool like move Xena yeah caught it caught my chakra thing um it's not going to do that for him this thing that he's using to turn to prove that he's successful is to turn on him and all but tear him apart and cut him to ribbon so uh living modestly my wife and I saved one thousand dollars now today i was working with a sponsee um, in this part of the book yesterday and so we looked it up which it would be about 16 grand um us dollars today keep in mind though um it fluctuates so you know we can write down 16 grand and who knows what that'll be but uh, today 16 grand they saved 16 grand it went into certain securities then cheap and rather unpopular I rightly imagined that they would someday have a great rise. So he's doing the, uh, what is it? You buy low, sell high. Like he's, he's on that. He says, I failed to persuade my broker friends to send me out looking over factories and management. So this, oh, we are on page two. Um, so this was the idea that Bill Wilson had. This was sort of his vision for, um, for like managing the stock market. So just as he was an investigator for the surety company, he's like, hey, we're up here in New York and we're betting on these companies like General Electric or General Motors or Ford Motor Company. And, and we're almost like gambling on them and doing so blind. Wouldn't it make sense if I go and I, and I investigated them like I did when I worked for that surety company to see how they're running things, to see if it's a good investment. And the people in, in Wall Street were like, that's a stupid idea, idea Bill. Absolutely not. Ugh, lunacy. Um, but he and his wife decided to go anyway. 
I had developed a theory that most people lost money in stocks through ignorance of markets, so they didn't have enough information. I discovered many more reasons later on. That is called foreshadowing. We will we'll see some of those reasons later on. Foreshadowing. Um, so this is April of 1925. He says, we gave up our positions and off we roared on a motorcycle. The sidecar stuffed with tents, blankets, a change of clothes, and three huge volumes of financial reference service. And this was at the point in the book where it would also be like, oh, poor Lois, just strapped in the sidecar, Bill going around. And oh, turns out, no, she. there were time, many times that she was driving that motorcycle. So you can find a picture of her on it. And also uh, years later when his wife Lois would speak at Al-Anon conventions, uh, if there was ever a motorcycle, she would always want to sit on it and have her picture taken. So just a fun little Lois story if you're like, oh, poor Lois. Fair enough. But she enjoyed the motorcycle. Um, and so our friends thought a lunacy commission should be appointed. So uh, what they're doing is they're going all up and down the eastern United States. And what they're doing is they're investigating these companies and, and they're seeing like who's a good investment and that sort of thing. And when it says our friends thought a lunacy commission should be appointed, our friends thought we were crazy. That's what it's saying. Um, perhaps they were right. I had some success at speculation. So we had a little money, but we once worked on a farm for a month to avoid drawing on our small capital. And so this was the Goldfoot Dairy Farm in Scotia, New York. I know that because I like having those fun facts. And sometimes I'll joke with people and I'll be like, the cow's name was Bessie. I don't know if that's true. I just made that, that part up. Uh, I can't tell you that. But I can tell you that he and his wife were both paid $75 uh, for, for that month of labor. But the owner's son, uh, the owner's son actually worked for General Electric. And so that was an in for him to connect with GE, General Electric, and, and to get some of those connections. And so when we talk about this weapon of drink and speculation, what we're really talking about is, is you know how if you wanted to invest in a company today, you couldn't just walk in, like, let's say you're like, hmm, I wonder if Tesla is a good investment. You couldn't walk into Tesla and be like, yo, Elon, uh, could I have a look at the books? You know, what's going on? What are we doing here? You couldn't do that then anyways. So what Bill would do is he would go to the bar and he would kind of do this schmoozing, the whining and dining. He would, um, you know, uh, drink with them. You know, that saying loose, lick, loose lips sink ship. So he would drink with them uh, and get secrets and make connections. So at this point, drinking is actually really working for him. So he's able to drink and make connections and get information. And, and it's that, that sword or that chakram, uh, that is working. And he is, it, it's, we're going to see what happens. So um, we covered the whole Eastern United States in a year. At the end of it, my reports to Wall Street procured me a position there. So we got a job at Wall Street and the use of a large expense account. Immediately, uh-oh, uh-oh. Cause like, I don't know about you guys, but like, I feel like as a people, we are, we are not, we are not ones who should have expense accounts. Well, alone like a large expense account, like, uh-oh, uh-oh. And for those who came a little late, we're on page three. So uh, the exercise of an option brought in more money, leaving us with a profit of several thousand dollars for that year. So if a thousand is a uh, uh, thousand is sixteen thousand, so it'd be about maybe let's say twenty four to forty eight thousand dollars in profit. So oh, that was a good idea, right? Bill's a smart guy. That was that was a good idea, and it's working for him. For the next few years, fortune threw money and applause my way. I had arrived. And I always like to make a little note of the I had arrived, because we are going to come back to that, because we are going to see how quickly I had arrived devolves into pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. We're going to see how quickly alcoholism starts to take over, how quickly it starts to boomerang for him. 
So my judgment and ideas were followed by many to the tune of paper millions. The great boom of the late 20s was seething and swelling. And you can and imagine like the great Gatsby, right? Like the opulence, the champagne, the flapper dresses, you know, it's money, things are going, like it's great, it's a boom. Uh, and we see drink was taking an important and exhilarating part of my life. And I know what that's like. And actually, um, I would suggest that I don't think non-alcoholics, I don't know, I haven't asked all of them, but I don't think non-alcoholics would ever say drink is important. If you ask a non-alcoholic, they will say family is important. Financial success is important. My values are important. But I know what it's like for drink to be important. And in those early days, it really can be exhilarating, right? Um, there's a gentleman who would come to my home group who would talk about how drinking for him was fun. And then it became fun with consequences. And then by the end, it was all consequences, right? So it's important that it's exhilarating. There was loud talk in the jazz places uptown. Everyone spent in thousands and shattered in millions. Scoffers could scoff and be damned. I made a host of fair weather friends. And that is a line I think so many of us relate to. We're like, yes, that's right. I had a lot of fair weather friends. I will, I will gently and lovingly suggest it takes a four step for us to be like, oh no, I too was a fair weather friend, <laughs> you know, because I come, you're the fair, oh, I'm the fair weather. Yeah. <laughs> My drinking assumed more serious proportions, continuing all day and almost every night. Again, if you're writing in your book, you can make a little note that that is likely a sign of the physical allergy. So he's not able to control the amount that he takes. The remonstrances of my friends terminated in a row and I became a lone wolf. So a remonst the remonstrances of his friends is like, Bill, what are, what are you doing? You're showing up here hammered. You can't be drunk at work. Bill, you're drinking too much. That Those are the remonstrances. And it says terminated in a row, which means ended in a fight. F off, don't tell me what to do. Get off my back. You don't know me. Um, you don't know if you went through what I, you don't, you know, ended in a fight and I became a lone wolf. So I relate to that where I'm starting to see some of the consequences, starting to, to lose those things as a result of, of my drinking, perhaps those relationships. There were many unhappy scenes in our sumptuous, uh, sumptuous apartment. There had been no real infidelity for loyalty to my wife helped at times by extreme drunkenness kept me out of those scrapes. That is where I was able to, as a codependent, uh, jealous girlfriend was able to be like, I think he cheated. <laughs> or the only thing that uh, kept him from cheating was that he was so drunk that he could not continue on as it were. Um, and so immediately I jumped to judgment. I'm like, oh, Bill. But what's my experience? Is my experience that as a result of the physical allergy, I put myself in situations when drinking that I never would have wanted to be in sober and connected with people in an intimate or physical or romantic way in ways that I would never, ever want to do that sober. And one of the things is I do know that Bill genuinely did really love his wife. And, and I'm starting to see, at least for me, where, you know, those lines in the sand that we begin to cross, that I cross, you know, and I start looking at myself in the mirror and I'm like, I don't want to be this person. I don't want to do this. And yet when I take a drink, I need more and I need more and I need more and I can't stop. I'm becoming somebody I can't recognize. In 1929, I contracted golf fever. So what he's saying is he, he's like, I got really excited about golf, got really into golf. <laughs> We, we went at once to the country, my wife to applaud while I started out to overtake Walter Hagen. And one of the things is I've, during like this Zoom era, I've had the privilege of, of traveling all over the world. And I won't like, I'll speak in generalities. What I will say is Canadians, we don't know who Walter Hagen is. I didn't know who Walter Hagen is. I had no idea, no idea. But if you go over to Scotland, they're like, yeah, it's Walter Hagen, right? They know, uh, which I, I think is so interesting about the cultural differences. But if we if we see Walter Hagen, we can think like a Tiger Woods or 
for our Canadians, like the Wayne Gretzky of golf, or for the Americans, Michael Jordan, or if I'm being contentious, LeBron James of basketball. See, yeah. uh, like just the best of the best of the best. Right. And, and uh, Walter Hagen, he won 11 majors. So he was like 11 time champion of golf. And isn't that kind of an interesting mindset? I started to get really excited at golf. I'm going to crush Walter Hagen. It's going to be better than that guy. And then very telling, liquor caught up with me much faster than I came up behind Walter. The consequences of the allergy are starting to really kick in. He says, I began to be jittery in the morning. <laughs> yeah, Brett's got the hockey talk. Um, I began to be jittery in the morning. So we're starting to see some of the consequences of drinking. And maybe you didn't have the shakes. Maybe you didn't have DTs. But did we come to with physical symptoms, bruises, unexplained injuries, those sorts of things, right? It says, golf permitting, permitted drinking every day and every night. It was fun to caroam around the exclusive course, which had inspired such on me as a lad. And the exclusive course is the Equinox Country Club in Manchester, Vermont. You can visit it and it, like, it's still going. And he says, I acquired the impeccable coat of tan one sees upon the well-to-do. Now, I just, um, at least for me, I think, I think it's very telling. That coat of tan really feels to me like a coat of armor. And maybe you don't read it that way. That's just what I see. See, golf, especially in the 1920s, was a rich white man's game. It is a game of success, a game of business. And he's got the tan that the well-to-do has. He's got this armor. So you can see that I'm important. The local banker watched me whirl. Uh, what, the local banker watched me whirl fat checks in and out of his till with amused skepticism. You know that, let's see how long this will last. And now it's when we transition. It says abruptly in October, 1929, hell broke loose on the New York Stock Exchange. So this is that Black Monday that, uh, oh, that happened in October. Like, oh, we're in October. Uh, that was that stock market crash that plunged the United States and then eventually the world into the Great Depression. And what I want to point out is the stock market crash affected everyone. Just kind of like how, you know, a couple of years ago, there was something that affected everyone. It's not just affecting Bill, but we're going to see how Bill responds to it. It says, after one of those days of inferno, so one of those days of hell. Now, keep in mind, Bill Wilson's whole financial life is in the stock market. And we can guess and we can gather that also his sense of worth and esteem and importance is also in the stock market. It's grounded in the stock market. And the stock market, Inferno, it's gone to hell. It's burning up. It's that meme with the dog that's like, this is fine. That's, that's what's happening in New York City at this time. He says, after one of those days of Inferno, I wobbled from a hotel bar to a brokerage office. Wobble is telling. I'm, I just want to suggest that only alcoholics wobble. People who do not have a physical allergy walk. They might even saunter. They might go for a jaunt. People who have the physical allergy wobble. <laughs> so I wobbled from a hotel bar to a brokerage office. It was eight o'clock, five hours after the market had closed. And that's also very interesting, right? His whole life, his esteem, his money, it's all wrapped up in the stock market. And he's showing up five hours after work is done to check the stocks. Why would he need to do that? And I don't know for sure, but my best guess is probably it was a bit of a stressful day for the guys at the office. And they go down to a, to a local pub and, and to have a beer at lunch to just unwind, to calm their nerves, so they can refocus for the second half of the day. And everyone else went back for the second half of the day. And Bill kept drinking. Is that not my experience, right? So the ticker still clattered. I was staring at an inch of tape 
which bore the inscription XYZ negative 32. It had been 52 that morning. So XYZ would be, it's a, an anonymous placeholder, just like if you look at the stock market, uh, they have those like, nowadays I think it's four. Don't quote me, I'm really, I, I don't, I'm not good at money stuff. Uh, but uh, I like God handle that. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, well, I, I'm not, but you know, anyway, they have those four letters, um, four letter symbols for a company. And so XYZ is just an anonymous placeholder. The, the company was actually Pennock and Ford, which was PFK. Again, you don't need to know that except to really win at 12 step trivia. So uh, we got you. <laughs> but imagine that you had $1 invested in Pennock and Ford. So in the morning, you would have had $52, right? And by the end of the day, you would have had negative $32, owing $32. Done. Broke. It's like, it's bad. It's bad. It says, um, I was finished. And so were many friends. The papers reported men jumping to death from the towers of I finance. So at that time, there were media reports of these mass suicides uh, in Wall Street. And there probably was an increase in Wall Street, uh, increase of Wall Street suicides, but they were kind of describing it as men jumping out of, of buildings, you know, kind of for shock value. And so that really would have like gone into his brain. And so he's reading this newspaper and he's like, these men killing themselves? This is how he responds. That disgusted me. Now we're going to see how quickly that changes for Bill. Uh, uh, that disgusted me. I would not jump. I went back to the bar. And so what we're seeing is that alcohol is really still working as a solution for Bill. It's still giving him that sense of ease and comfort. It's, he's got no reason to kill himself. He has a solution. His solution is still alcohol. Alcohol is working. He doesn't have to jump. He doesn't have to consider suicide at this point in his story. And how many of us have, have come to booze like this? You know, I know for me, um, a lot of times, and, and we'll talk about it as we read Bill Wilson's uh, spiritual experience. Uh, but it's where, where it's like, man, I don't know if I could have an experience like that. But I never sold the power of alcohol short, right? There was not a single problem that I came to that I did not think alcohol would solve. And then as soon as I started to drink, I'd get that sense of ease and comfort that we've spoken in the cycle. And I experienced what they'll experience, which is my friends have dropped several millions in 10 o'clock. So what? So what? Right? So what? Tomorrow was another day. As I drank, that old fierce determination to win came back. It's soothing that spiritual malady. It's giving him that sense of ease and comfort. The next morning, I telephoned a friend in Montreal. And uh, this is just to kind of keep a, an eye on the timeline. This is 1930. Uh, and he says, I telephoned a friend in Montreal. The, again, this is not important information, um, but his name was Dick Johnson, and uh, you will always remember that. <laughs> Just one of those, one of those things. Now you know forever. And the company he worked for was Green Shields and Co. And again, you won't remember that, but we'll remember, we'll remember his Canadian friend. Um, so he, I, the next morning, I telephoned, a friend, I telephoned a friend in Montreal. He had plenty of money left and thought I had better go to Canada. So uh, in terms of the economy, it took a little while for the stock market of, uh, crash to, to affect uh, Canada. And when I'm in a meeting with people from all over the world, um, I really like to make the joke, oh, good. Oh, good. He's going to Canada. There's no alcoholics there. <sighs> yeah, uh, and it says by the following spring, we were living in our custom style. So the stock market crash happened to everyone, but he was able to get back on his feet by going to Canada. Just going to suggest Canada is not a solution for alcoholism. I felt like Napoleon returning from Elba. No St. Helena for me. 
And one of the things I'll point out is uh, Napoleon, uh, he was the emperor of France. And uh, he was actually the self-proclaimed emperor of France. And there's a lot of beautiful me uh, metaphors. And I'll probably, uh, you know, finish on the bottom of page four, um, just kind of giving us some history of Napoleon, uh, but to explain this metaphor. So Napoleon came and he, he conquered France. And, and how France was ruled before Napoleon uh, was sort of the lineage of the, of the French monarchy. And I don't, this is not my belief, but this is, was the belief that they had for the French monarchy, that it was through the bloodline and that bloodline was ordained by God. And so uh, when you would be crowned uh, as king of France, you would have the Pope crown you and the Pope would be like, God said, this is cool. Um, you know, more formally than that. Uh, but uh, Napoleon, when he decided, he, he's like, no, no, I am the emperor of France. And there's this famous painting of him taking the the it's a laurel wreath this this uh essentially crown a gold crown of of laurel wreath and placing it on his own head saying i like i have decided i am emperor now again there's a lot of hubris in that that i do not relate to but do i know what it's like to be the emperor or empress or the ruler of my life. And maybe not like I am Queen Paige, but I think I know what's best for me. And I think I know what I need to be happy. Just like Bill was deciding this is what I need. And so Napoleon, um, and there was a series of um, invading Russia and oopsie doodles getting the butt kicked from Russia. Uh, and so they were like, get out of here, Napoleon. By the way, if you're gonna take this to like a history professor, oopsie doodles and, and uh, in Russia and get out of here, Napoleon was probably not how it formally went down, uh, but it's the language I use. Uh, so they, they exiled him. So they exiled him to Elba, this, this tiny island in the Mediterranean, where it's like, you you go off there, they don't want to kill him because that'll start a, a revolt, a revolution, but you get out of here. And that's what Bill felt like when the stock market crashed, that he was exiled. He didn't have the thing that made him feel so important. He didn't have that. And then he comes back and B uh, Bill Wilson comes back in Montreal, uh, which just like Napoleon came back to France and Napoleon is like, that's it. I'm the emperor again. Heck yeah, I'm running the show. And to which France was like, oh, heck no, absolutely not. We're going to exile you to this tiny, tiny island in the Atlantic called St. Saint, Saint Helena. And it's like, it's so remote, you'd have to like fly to South Africa and take probably a boat uh, that would take you about maybe even a month to get there. Like it is a remote, remote, remote island. And that's where he lived out his days. And Bill's like, I feel like Napoleon, I'm running France. I'm not gonna get exiled again. Well, let's see what happens. <laughs> um, but drinking caught up with me again. And my generous friend had to let me go. So it's not the stock market that caught up with him. It's not the economy that caught up with him. It was drinking. It is the physical allergy. He's drinking to the point where he is getting tired. This time we stayed broke. He says, we went to live with my wife's parents. Oh, he's living with the in-laws. Oh. And I, if you're interested, um, where, where it was, was 182 Clinton Street uh, in, um, in New York. And uh, he lived there until 1938. Um, and he, they actually lost the family home in sobriety. And I just find that interesting because sobriety does not mean financially things are going to be perfect and life's going to be perfect. Um, and there was a lot of financial struggles. And yet something more powerful than that happened. So he went to live with his wife's parents. Ugh! Living with the in-laws. And uh, one of the things, um, well, I'll talk about it here in a sec. It says, I found a job. And so this job is was working as, as an investigator again. So, you know, kind of like kind of in his wheelhouse. And, and he was were earning $100 a week, which was good money in those days, you know, especially after the stock market crashed. And they needed that money because they were $60,000 in debt. He's making $100 a week they're in trouble, right? And so he needs this job and he loses it as the result of a brawl with a taxi driver. 
Again, who is rolling with the taxi driver? People who have the physical allergies. People that once they start to drink, they cannot control the amount they take. Because if I can control the amount I take, I'm stopping several drinks before brawling with the taxi driver. You know what I mean? So just if you have ever brawled with the taxi cab driver, we can talk about amends. Uh, and that's really like, man, it's a sign that he's really starting to lose it. It's starting to get serious. And he said, mercifully, no one could guess that I was to have no real employment for five years. So that's from 1930 to 1935. And we're going to cover those five years in the rest of his story or hardly draw a sober breath. My wife began to work at a department store, coming home exhausted to find me drunk. And uh, she was only making $19 a week. And uh, she would work at places like Macy's and, and sort of design the displays. Now, um, one of the things is, is we don't necessarily need to subscribe to traditional gender roles of the 1930s. But can we imagine what it is like as a man in 1930 where there's some societal expectations of him to be the man, the provider, do these things and show up. And he has to live with his wife's parents and his wife is supporting him financially. Again, we don't have to buy into those roles or that sort of thing, but do I know what it's like to have shame? Do I know what it's like to have that deep feeling that I am letting everyone in my life down, that I'm disappointing them and I'm not living up to those expectations? Because that's how Bill is very likely feeling. So it's 701. So why don't we wrap it up or 701 or um, 801 or 901, just depending on where we're one after the hour. So why don't we wrap it up right there and we'll pick up next week at the stop at the start of page five.